Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, today, uh, Pastor uh, Armando Miranda, who's the Associate Youth Director for the Texas Conference, will be preaching for us today. And we're uh, very glad that he's here with us. I know that the conference is extremely um, anxious, or they have this strong desire to save our kids as well. So they um, have several activities and stuff. And uh, I saw a video of, um, that uh, Gary Blanchard posted of the progress being done at Lake Whitney Ranch. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful cabin, the one that I saw. So we're so glad that he is here with us today. And he's going to be the one preaching um, this morning. Uh, pastor Miranda, who was uh, actually the student pastor of the King Church when I think I was a junior in high school. But uh, we have known each other for... Uh, for quite a long time. As a matter of fact, my dad knew his dad and uh, looked up to him when uh, when they were younger men in Mexico. But thank you so much, Pastor Miranda. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, as he mentioned, my name's uh, Armando Miranda Jr. Um, my dad is also the same name, and he's also a pastor. So it's like have to really emphasize it as a junior so that you know people understand who who is speaking. Sometimes I go to churches that they know my dad and. They come to see Pastor Miranda, and then they see me as like, ah, it's you. <laughs> so it's okay. I don't mind. Um, still, we're uh, on the same work, same line of work, uh, praising the Lord and trying to uh, preach His coming. I want to share with you something that he was, uh, Pastor Perea was sharing. You have heard about summer camp, right? And so I'm going to ask someone to help me. Young ladies, you want to help me out? Do you want to give one to everyone? Uh, just share them over there with you. There you go. Um, for those of you who are watching us, we do have a summer camp program coming up. Actually, next week on the 15th, on Sunday, is the first week of summer camp. And it's Lake Whitney Ranch, so it's not that far. It's about three hours, four hours away, around there. And uh, as you see over there, um, they, there's a lot of progress in made. We do have two buildings done. So our campers are going to be in nice, cool uh, buildings. Not only cool because they look cool, but because they are going to be cool. Um, you know, we have a great insulation. It's, you know, in the heat of Texas in July, it gets pretty bad. Well, that is not going to be any problem anymore. It's going to be a great building. We have, as you can see, all the information there. Just wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. More, there you go. Um, please go to the website if you're interested for more information or talk to me afterwards so I can give you a little more information uh, about what we're going to have at summer camp. But, of course, we're going to have lake activities, horses, uh, you know, archery. Uh, we're going to have mountain bike riding and crafts and swimming and basketball and everything. I think soccer, too. So we're going to have so many things uh, ready for the kids. So please... Uh, feel free to ask and feel free to go to the website, youngtexasavenist.org. Uh, Young Texas Avenist. Young Texas Avenist. Everybody got it? Let's see. Youngtexasavenist.org. All right. Without further ado, we do have a time limit from what I understand. Uh, Pastor Perez said that he loves food so much that at 12 we stop and we go eat, right? No matter if the preacher is still preaching, they go eat. Okay? Uh, Pastor Perez has always uh, loved food as, as you get to know him more and more. You'll see that hey, he, he follow up, follows up on that. But before we go on that one, let us ask the Lord to be with us today, okay? Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much. You're good to us. As we open your word, may the words in there be a light to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about 1 Samuel chapter 17. Everybody, if you can go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I know that all of us know this story at some point. All Sabbath schools have it every single year. At some point during the year, you have this story. The story of David and Goliath. How many of you do not know that story? No, all of you know it. Okay, good. Let me just tell you a little bit about this story because I want you to see what God has for us today. First of all, this is a story not only about David and Goliath, but it goes beyond that. 
You see in verse 1 through verse 3, it tells us that there's two armies ready to fight each other, ready to go to war. They are so pumped up, you know, when they're like, yeah, we're going to do it. Yes, we're going to attack the Philistines, and they're going to be, you know, that kind of talk. We're going to destroy them. They're going to be defeated by us. We're going to be great. And the Philistines are saying the same thing about the Israelites. Oh, the Israelites are going down. They don't know what's coming. They're going to get it. And you know what? They were probably partly true. Because the moment that we are introduced in chapter 4, we're introduced to the secret weapon. Look at this. Verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Do you know how tall was six cubits and a span? No, let me just give you a glimpse of what it was. You see the ceiling? Okay, so it was me plus three feet up, all the way to the ceiling. So he was basically over nine feet tall. Have you ever seen a person who's nine feet tall? I've seen Shaq uh, from uh, basketball. He, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal. He was seven feet two. Can you imagine nine feet? Two more feet than Shaq. I mean, you stand up to Shaq and you look, you look at him and, oh, he's big. Well, let me tell you. I know for a fact. How do I know? Because a giant like that cannot be skinny. He cannot be, yeah, um, uh, you know how I know he was big? Because what he was wearing, look at this. It says in verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he, ha he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. You know how much, around how much was 5,000 shek 5, shekels? It was like 250 pounds of just the coat. Can you imagine? That's how much I weigh. I cannot even carry myself. And he was carrying that like nothing. Because not only was he wearing that, he was wearing a helmet. Not only was he wearing a helmet, it also says in verse 6, he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. He was carrying a javelin. He was carrying everything, all the armor. And I tell you, a skinny person cannot carry that. He was muscular. He was big. And he was mean. You know? This Goliath looked more and more like someone that you don't want to meet at night when you're kind of like, oh, wow, no, hello, I'm going the other way. You know those moments when you kind of meet someone you don't want to meet? It's like, uh, okay, I'm going the other way. Exactly that way. This Goliath is just a humongous human being. Verse 7 tells us that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. As you can see, this giant is the biggest thing that Israelites probably have seen. And it is someone that you don't want to meet in the battlefield, because no one is nine feet tall to face him. No one has the armor that this guy has. And so everybody's looking at him, and the Israelites are like, hey, man, ready? Yeah, 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 let's go. But wait a minute. What is that? Whoa, where did they brought this guy? Who was his mom? Because he fed him a lot of things. He grew up too much. Man, I can see them over there talking to each other, saying, um, so what do we do now? So how do we fight this giant? You see, verse 8. He not only looked mean, he also talked mean. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to, uh, to line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him down, come down to me. If he's able to fight with me, and I can... I can imagine him being a little sarcastic, you know, with that tone. If he's able to come down and fight with me <laughs> and defeat me, we will be your servants. And then I can see his tone change. But if I, because I will, 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine, verse 10, said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now this was a challenge. This was something that you either accept it or you don't. And if you don't, then what happens? Well, if it's a battle, uh, more than likely people are going to think, well, they are cowards. Nobody wants to take up the challenge. Who's up to the challenge? Look at what verse 11 says. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were what? Dismayed and greatly afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid, though? I would be. I mean, I don't want to fight anybody who's nine feet tall at all. I don't want to even play basketball with someone who's seven feet. I've been dunked on already by someone who was seven feet, and I didn't like it. Just imagine, that's a game. Can you imagine a battle when he comes with his sword, with his armor, looking mean, talking mean, and ready to destroy you? I wouldn't want to be in front of a giant like that. And I can understand when it says, verse 11, that all of them were dismayed and greatly afraid. I can understand up to a point. Because we could be afraid of that person, right? I mean, if he's mean and talks mean and looks mean, must be mean, right? But, isn't Saul, the king, taller than all the Israelites? Remember, when he was chosen, he stood head and shoulders above everybody. Now, I'm, I don't know the average you know, height of the Israelites, I'm assuming that it was probably 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, you know, let's say that that's the case. So if he's above head and shoulders, let's say he's probably around 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, you know, probably there. That is closer to 9 feet than 6 feet tall, right? So by default, you say, okay, um, who's going to go? Well, the only one who can probably match him, I think, is our king. You know, he's a little taller, he's a little bigger, he is the king after all, right? So king... We're looking to you for leadership on this. Don't you love this? You know? Everybody looks at him and the king is like, um, sure. What is it again that we're going to do? <laughs> you see, because it says over here that Saul was dismayed and greatly afraid too. Now, there's a problem with this. That's the reason I say we could be afraid up to a point. Why? You see, sometimes... You and I face big giants in our lives. Sometimes life circumstances are not the best for you. Sometimes that debt is going to kill you, at least you think. There's no way that I can keep this house. There's no way that I can keep this car. There's no way that I can pay for lunch this week. I have no money. Some of the giants can be other things. Some of the giants can be Addictions to anything. In this world, we are seeing more and more addictions to drugs, to uh, alcohol, addictions to anything that is on the internet. And we are faced with those things. And we look at those things. And those things are, seem to taunt us every day. What are you going to do about it? What are you doing about it? You can't defeat me. You have no money. There's no way that you can get out of this addiction at all. You're tired. You're sad. <laughs> Even better. I'm going to crush you. And you're going to serve me all the days of your life. And you hear these voices of these giants talking down to you like you have no God. Oh, but that's the point. You do have a God. And you do have someone who has defeated Everything that's come against him before. What the children of Israel have forgotten here, and you see it in the story, they're dismayed and greatly afraid because they have forgotten that God is with them. Sometimes you and I may forget that. Sometimes you and I may think that there's no exit or no way out. The giants are so big. Sometimes you may have forgotten 
that God is with you. The Bible says in Romans, we just, we just uh, read it in the Sabbath school, if God is with us, who can be against us? And it seems that the Israelites simply have forgotten that God is with them. King Saul has forgotten that God is with him. And this is where God intervenes and sends the most unlikely hero that you could ever find. Because you have all this war people, you know? Can you imagine a room, a war room, with all the generals, with all the lieutenants, with the sergeants, and everybody, okay, what is the strategy? Well, you know, we can do this and this and this. But then we have to face Goliath. How are we going to do that? Well, he's one big guy. Yes, he is mean. And he could probably destroy anybody here, even King Saul. So what are we going to do? And you have the war room right there with everybody who's an expert in war. But God does not use a war person. He doesn't even use an adult. It's kind of interesting. You know, you think about young people, and you think how sometimes we think that they're not ready to do anything for God, right? But most of the time, and I say most of the time because I can remember stories from the Bible For some young people, like Joseph, like Daniel, Daniel's friends, and in this case, David, all young people actually were the instruments that God used to teach not only everybody a lesson where they were, but to teach us a lesson. Listen to this. After that, he's introduced. Now David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah. Verse 12 whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons, and the man was old, the bands and years, the days of Saul. Basically, it tells you that David is here. Now, it tells you also what is his profession. What is David's profession? Is he actually a soldier that battles every day? Is he someone who strategizes how to take over people and how to destroy giants? Is he someone who is experienced in the art of war? What is David? A shepherd. Now think about it for a moment. you got the war room with people ready. Well, we need to have this and this and that. We need to have a champion. Champion who has fought, who is experienced, who is ready to go. And, David provi- uh, and God provides what? A shepherd boy. Isn't that amazing? It shows me something. It shows me that God does not look at the outside. Oh, we heard that before, right? Oh, the chapter before, yes. God does not look at the outside of someone, but he looks where? In the inside, inside, in his heart. If God puts David there, it's for a reason. Because God knows that David has the heart that needs to be there to fight the giant. Now, we don't know that. And I'm assuming that Saul and all the war people there in the Israelite camp did not understand that. Because David comes, his dad sends him, and you can read the story. He sends him to take bread, to take cheese, take some stuff for, for, for his brothers. And so David comes, and it tells me, the story tells me that for 40 days, this giant has been antagonizing the people of God. He's been cursing, and he's been saying things about, well, when are you going to send someone? Come on, let's get it on, let's, let's, let's fight, let's finish this for 40 days. The Israelites are scared. Every time that Goliath comes down that hill, every time they get scared. And I wonder, where is their faith? And I am tempted to tell them, look guys, where, where is your faith? But then I cannot judge him because many times in my life I've done the same. Many times in my life, there's been days where I've been down and out. There's been days that I don't know what to do. And I'm looking at my giant and I'm saying... How am I going to get out of this one? How am I going to actually do something for a change that will actually improve my life? And we look like the Israelites sometimes. We're 40 days waiting to see what would, what would happen. I cannot judge him because many times I'm like that. But God has always a solution. That's the beautiful thing about it, right? God sends a shepherd. Isn't it amazing? 
God sends the most unlikely person to come and defeat the giant. And you, you can actually see the type, the, the, the example, the symbol. Because when Jesus came, he was the most unlikely person to come from Nazareth, right? Remember that? And actually, he was called the good shepherd, too. He was also someone who was not rich, who was not experienced in, in the schools of the rabbis. He was not someone who people would look, oh, oh, he has a great potential for the future. Jesus came out of nowhere, basically. But that's the way God acts many times, because he has to show us that it's not about the experience, it's not about what you can do, it's about what God is doing in the hearts of the person who he's sending. No matter if he's 17, no matter if he's 60, God has a purpose. And look at this. He comes and then he sees, in verse 21 and up, you know, he sees that the, 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 the Philistine is defying the armies of God and David gets fired up because it says over here, um, over here, verse 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man fled from him and were dreadfully af afraid. But, you know... So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will en enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David said, So what's going to happen? Well, we just said it, but this is what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to marry into the kingdom. You're going to get tax exempt. You're going to be rich. But who's going to go against Goliath? I don't see it. I can't see it. Who's going to try to be marrying into the kingdom? More than likely, you're going to be crushed and you're not going to ever see any rich, uh, rich, uh, rich over there. So, David does something. And this is where, where we jump all the way to verse 31. Because the words come to Saul because he says, I'll do something about it. I'll do something about it. Look at what he says over there. Verse 26, uh, the last part. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David got on fire. He says, it can, nobody can talk about my God that way. Nobody should do that. Let's do something. And everybody's like, oh, go ahead. Be our guest. We don't want to do that. And I don't think they're going to allow you. You're too young. Who are you, David? You're the youngest. You're a shepherd. Be quiet. You have nothing to say here. This is, a, this is where men fight. This is where men plan on how to take over people. Just go somewhere. But the words came in verse 31. The words which David spoke were heard. They reported them to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Look at what happens over here. This is my favorite, one of my favorite parts. Then David said to Saul, Let no, man hard, no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, this is a 17, 18 year old speaking. I can imagine sometimes in our church committees and boards, sometimes we don't know and, and, and we're dreading a decision. Ah, I, uh, we don't know, Pastor. I, I don't know if, if that can be done. Come on, over here in this town, we've tried everything. Simply people just don't respond. That's our giant. The, the town, the people, they just don't respond to anything we do. That may be your giant, but. We may need to hear the words of David. <laughs> what is this town that should be defying our God? Isn't our God bigger than anything? Isn't our God po more powerful? And is, doesn't our God open doors that we don't even think? Hello, don't you remember the Red Sea? He opens even seas. So David comes and says, don't worry about it. I'm going to do it. I wish we could have more faith like that in our churches. I wish we could have the faith of a young person to say, let's go, let's take it over, let's do it. We're going to do it. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are what? Verse 33. This is what it says. You are what? You are a youth. You are young. <laughs> and he is a man of war since he was a little kid. He's big, he's mean, he's tall, and he's experienced. You're going to go down, David. You can't go fight. But I love his response. Verse 34, listen to this. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. 
And I can see everybody, oh, here it goes, another story about the sheep. Come on, David, don't you have anything else to say? Don't you have any new, oh, no, you don't, you're a shepherd. That's the only stories you know. But I can, I can see David don't, not even worrying about anybody saying anything. And look at what he says over here. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Boo! This boy was skilled. I was telling uh, uh, Ezekiel earlier, you know, when, when I look at lions and bears, I like them where they are in the zoo. You know, that's, that's me. Uh, even if I see some wild animals when I'm camping, I try to stay very far away from them. You know, something about, you know, bobcats and, and uh, you know, things like that, that even though they're small, you, you, you want to keep your distance. You know, even deer, you, you try to get close and they get away. So wild animals, especially if they're angry and they're hungry, you don't want to be close to them at all. Over here says that a lion or a lamb came because they wanted to eat the lambs. He would go after them. And when they turn on David, he would turn and strike them and kill them both. Can you imagine that? A 17-year-old experience. God provided something of training while he was a shepherd. And, you know, sometimes we don't see this, but I don't think David would have been able to defeat Goliath if he wasn't for that lion or that uh, bear. Now think about it. Many times in our lives, we get things happening in our lives that we don't understand until later. Some giants come to your life and you're worrying. It's like, why is this happening to me? And then you go through, it's like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But you know what? God has even better things for you later on. But you would not be able to do those things if you did not go through those things before. If you didn't face circumstances that were against all odds, and you didn't trust God, you wouldn't be able to do bigger things. So I believe that David would not be able to defeat the giant without being able to defeat the lion or the, or, or the bear. Now listen to this. Here it is. Verse 36. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be one, will be like one of them. Seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. This is the difference between Sometimes our solution to the problems and the solution that David has for the problem. Many times you and I think that we will make it through and we fight hard. We fight hard against that giant. We try to defeat addic addiction. We try to defeat debt by our own purposes. We don't even pray about it. We just say, this looks like the best decision. Let's go for it. While David says, look, I have nothing going for me against this guy. Actually, I do. I have God. And when I have God, I have everything I need. You see, God has delivered me from the lion and the bear. Of course He's going to deliver me from this giant. Why? Because God delivers. If you trust Him, He delivers. If you follow Him, He delivers. If you follow where He is sending you, He will show you a way. He will open a door. He will provide. We forget that. That's the reason that Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Of course, when he says, Go and the Lord be with you, he says, Well, go and the Lord be with you, but put some armor. You know, let, let's, let's protect you. And he puts some armor, and David says, I can't, I can't do this. And he takes the armor off, and he goes. And everyone's like, yeah, Well, you know, David, it was nice meeting you. Uh, we love you. Uh, let's start, you know, you, you have your letter for your dad saying that you're basically cooked meat with the Goliath. All right, yes, you're ready. Okay, David, I don't know what you're, you're, you're crazy, but of course, 17 years old must be crazy to do things like that. So go ahead, David, we'll be cheering on, and we hope that it's quick and swift for you. Because we're not looking at the future with you victorious. I can see that happening. Why? Because they were men of war, and they're looking at the odds. They're looking at someone who is a young person who might not be even mu mus muscular enough. Because, you know, he's 17 years old. He's still developing. And then they see this nine feet tall guy, men of war, with all these things. 
the odds are against David. Fully, completely. So I can see them, you know, it was nice meeting you, David. It's nice meeting you. But David is not looking and listening to them. This is, with this, we, we're, we're finished. He took his staff, verse 40, in his hands. He chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he, which he had. And his ling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. Not only did he have to go through the, the, through, through, um, uh, through the armor bearer, but, you know, there's two people that he needed to get through. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For David was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. It was very interesting. The Goliath takes notice of that. Oh, here comes a young person. Oh, he's handsome. Wait, wait, what? What, what is going on? That's the reason 43 happens after that. Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And I can see David's face listening to those curses. He's talking to my God. He's talking about my God. He's saying bad things about my people. He's talking about how God is this and that. I can't take it. Why? Because my God is more powerful than that. And he will pay for it. That is the reason 44 starts talking about. The Philistine said, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. But then David responded. He didn't even let Goliath speak that much. Look at this. I love it. Verse 45. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Ooh. You know, David knew who his God was. David knew his identity. Have we forgotten ours? Have we forgotten that we serve a mighty God? Have we forgotten that God can deliver and will deliver? That he will provide, that he will guide, that he will bless? Have we forgotten that? David did not. He knew that the only way that he had a chance against this giant was because of God. It was nothing that David had done, but because he came with the power of God with him. Do people notice when we go into their presence as someone who is with God? Do people see us as someone who has been with God? Do people see that? Verse 46. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. This is rated R, by the way. So this is part of the Bible that we don't teach at Sabbath school for kids, right? Uh, we just teach a little things and we don't, you know, we don't go over these verses. But this is in the Bible. This is what it says. I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You have defied us for 40 days. You have mocked us. You have asked for a champion. Well, the champion is the Lord. The champion is going to show up and is going to show you that he is God of Israel. You see, David did not say, I am the champion. David did not come in the name of, the, uh, of, of his house, of the house of Jesse, the, Ephraim, uh, the people of, of Bethlehem. He did not come that way. He came in the name of the Lord, the champion. Hmm. 47. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. The Lord does not save with warriors here. <laughs> of course, because he sent the shepherd. He knew what he was. David knew what, where he was coming from. He knew he did not have experience. He knew he did not have enough training in the eyes of people. But he had what everybody was lacking. He had the heart for God. Do you have the heart for God in your life? Do you have God in your heart so much that no matter what comes at you, you're ready? Because God is with you. I like the next part. He knew that he was not going to be battling. The battle is the Lord's. 
when that big debt comes to your life and you have no way out, do you sit, uh, do you, do you sit down and just think about things and say, I don't know when I'm going to do it? Or do you actually go to your knees and say, God, this is yours. Show up. Help me. Do it. Because you see, God has asked us to, if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. And this is what David is saying. It is not my problem how this is going to happen today. It is God's problem. It is God's battle. The battle is the Lord's. And He will give you into our hands. I don't know how yet. I have my sling, but I don't know. You got your armor bearer in front. And you got all this, you know, armor in front of you. I don't know how that's going to happen, but it, the battle is the Lord's. And He will give you into our hands. Look at this. You see it over there. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. This guy was ready. He was ready because God was with him. And it was amazing how when we understand that God is with us, that we can do anything for him. Isn't there a verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 that says something about that? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I know that David did not know Paul, but I knew he knew the principle that he could do everything in God's name. Isn't that amazing? He ran to it. He did not wait for Goliath to come. He ran to the problem. He says, you know, God, it's your battle. Here it is. Let's go. So it was. Then David put his hand in his back and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. So the stone sang into his forehead and he fell on his face. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the Bible emphasizes that? David prevailed over the Philistine. This great, mighty man, tall, huge, nine feet tall. He prevailed over this warrior with a sling and a stone. It is not about the size that you have. It is about the heart that you have. It is not about the training that you have. It is not the age, the experience that you have. If you have your identity in Christ and God, then you will be able to go through. It is your identity that matters. It is your identity that matters. So today, I want to challenge you today. I don't know what kind of giants you have. I don't know which kind of problems you are facing at this time. Remember that if you are with God, who can be against you? Remember that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and protects them. Remember that when you walk through the valley of shadow and death, you shall fear no evil because God is with you. Remember that when you are actually, through, when you walk through the fire, the fire will not scorch you. When you walk through the flame, nothing will happen to you. Remember that God is with you. That is your true identity. You're a child of God. No matter what happens in your life, the devil may be out like a roaring lion trying to eat you alive. But if you are with God, you can be like David. You can have the heart of David and the words of David and say, you know what? It's not my battle. It is God's battle. The battle is the Lord's. He will deliver I don't know how we're going to make the next payment, but God will deliver because I'm trying to be faithful. And as we spoke in the morning in Sabbath school, the covenant, He will fulfill His covenant. He will fulfill His promise. We have to be faithful. But that's our identity. I pray that you today, from the story of the Bible, from the story of David, a story that is not about only David and Goliath, but about our faith in God that you may take a good lesson today, that you may understand that the battle is the Lord's and that you are a chosen children of God. May God bless you. May you face up your giants, not alone, but in the name of the Lord. Amen.